Good morning, everybody. And for those of you that are watching online, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are around the world. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Anka Cotwell, and I'm on the uh, Google Maps API team. So the Google Maps APIs have been around for over 10 years. It's one of Google's first APIs. And in that time, we've added a lot of functionality to these APIs. And sometimes that's meant introducing new APIs. Sometimes that's meant adding these capabilities within existing APIs. That's led to an interesting challenge, actually. So if you look here, we have a lot of APIs. And we support the web, Android, iOS. We have a, a number of great web services to help, you, uh, to help provide data to each of those platforms as well. But some of the feedback that we've had from you is this functionality is great, but it's a bit daunting to get started. Right? How, do I, how do I look at this and go, OK, what are the things that I'm going to need for my business, my use case? It's kind of a nice problem to have. But even if you're not new to us, if you're a seasoned Google Maps API user, you probably have faced this. And we publish blog posts and release notes and videos to try and keep you up to date. But it can be daunting. So if I took a, a different analogy, up until now, we have been giving you the tools and the components and some instructions to help you piece together your software solution. To take that metaphor further, if you're thinking of like, your software solution as a lounge room, you, we were helping you build those components, the, the, the parts that go in a lounge room, a drawer, uh, a table, a couch. Today, what I want to do is talk to you about something new that we're doing in addition to providing you these APIs. We call them solutions. And in this case, we want to provide you the lounge room. We want to provide you a reference implementation to help get you started with the best of breed Maps application, depending on your use case. And we're going to make it entirely open source. We're publishing it on our developer site, along with supporting documentation, so that you can grab this and say, you know what? I want to change the color, or I want to swap one component, one of my software components out with something else. But your starting point is a great one. And even if you have an existing application, you could maybe borrow some of the uh, features or capabilities that we are adding to these solutions. So let's move on to talking about these solutions. As my team went to start building these out, we started to come up with different architectures that we would have for different Maps API uses. And the one thing that we kept coming back to that was sort of defining what our architecture would be was location data. So depending on the type of data you have would dictate what kind of architecture you use. And so broadly speaking, we had three types of location data. Static data, data that doesn't change very often. We had dynamic data that does change, that maybe you have things like user-generated content where you want to show photos. Or in the case of a real estate application, uh, more houses are coming on the market or being taken out of the market. And then you have real-time data as well for things like tracking vehicles in real time. And then as we started to build that out, we came up with a way to split that static data use case into two. One which is entirely just client-side. You don't need to have a server beyond your web server. So today's talk, we're going to go through these solutions. We've built these out. We've published them. And we want to share them with you and uh, hope to jumpstart your development. So the first one we're going to look at is a, uh, the, the static data, the client side only example. And it's the coffee shop finder. This is a very common scenario for a store locator. We've come up with a fictional coffee shop called Josie's Patisserie and Cafe. And Josie basically has a, a successful business in the UK. She's got a number of stores. And often that data doesn't change, right? She's got a fixed number of shops. Um, she may have a new store opening up, or the opening hours and closing hours might change depending on seasonality or holidays. But effectively, there's not a lot of change there. So what we're going to do is look at a quick demo of uh, Josie's sh uh, coffee shop finder. And so if we can split, uh, shift to the laptop, that's great. So here we're just showing you the map. 
We don't expect that your whole website or app would be just entirely the map, but you can see the map section of it, and that's what we're going to cover in the solution. So the first thing you notice is that it is a Google map, but it looks different. It's because we've used a custom style. We've muted the colors a little bit, and we've aligned it more closely with Josie's brand. So let's have a look at Josie's Liverpool patisserie. And immediately, you see some text that says, describes uh, the store. It shows the opening hours and some contact details. Probably my favorite feature is the image, though. We're using the Street View Image API to show you what the shop front looks like so that when uh, customers are going to come to the actual destination, they can see it. Let's switch to a cafe, Josie's Cafe in Oakham, and again, similar data. So this is a very basic store locator app, but I want to show you how we built it. So let's switch back to the slides, please. If you look at the architecture for this particular example, it's really, really simple. We have three files that are just sitting on a web server, and this is that client-side only code. You'll notice we have the, the web page, the index.html. We have a JavaScript file and a JSON file. That contains the data for the stores. And I'll show you what, why that's important. The actual implementation of this is actually very, very simple. We're going to initialize the map. We're going to put all our data on it and style it. And then we're going to add a click listener so that when users click on the marker, we populate it with the relevant information. So in terms of initializing the map, for any of you that have used the Maps API, the JavaScript Maps API before, you'll be familiar with this. We add a div on there, uh, which is a map. And then we add an asynchronous script to go and load the actual Maps API. So that URL will be ve very familiar to you. We substitute API underscore key with our API key. We lock it down so it's only useful on our domain, so people aren't using our API key. But the important thing is we have this callback parameter on the right-hand side. When the map is loaded, it's going to call back our init function. And we're going to go ahead and initialize the map. We're just going to set the zoom level to what we want it to be set to, uh, the latitude, longitude, and apply our style. Very, very basic. Now, remember I said that we have a JSON file. Well, that JSON file contains all the store data so that we're just following programming best practices, separating our data out from our code. And by using GeoJSON, which is an open standard for geographical data, it means that we just have a simple JSON file that's structured in a particular way. And loading that JSON file onto our map gives us some advantages. So advantages like pre-populating the map with the data, uh, applying marker styles, um, and even attributing that metadata. So in code, when we need to refer to fields, it'll just do it for us. But my favorite part of using GeoJSON to put that data on a map, it's a single line of code. Our Maps API support this. You just say map.data.loadgeojson, take that store file, and it's done. Just wanted to give a quick demonstration to what the structure of that file is like. Uh, you don't need to look at the details here. We've, as I said, we've open sourced this, so you can have a look at it in, in greater detail offline. But that's it. That's what GeoJSON gives us. Now, we're going to go look at the event click listener. And the way we add that is we, we tell the map, hey, we want to add a, a click listener. And it's going to execute this code. I've put some ellipses in there to get rid of some of the boilerplate code. But basically, we're going to initialize some local fields. And that info window, that speech bubble that we saw, it's just when we set content in there, it's just HTML. So the way we laid out those images, the Street View image API, it's just, just general HTML that we're, we're populating it with. And the reason that, that source over there is particularly long is because that's how we're calling the Street View image API. And we're saying, here's our API key. And then for each of Josie's stores, we're saying, here's the latitude, longitude. Uh, so go and fetch us that particular Street View image and put it in line. But it's as simple as that. We didn't have to go and like, do a lookup as to which marker corresponded to which data. Because we used GeoJSON, that attribution was already done for us. It's, it's really, really neat. And then the last thing that we do here is just go ahead and position the info window and open it so that it displays. So here, in this simple store locator example, we use the JavaScript API and we use the Street View image API. But the cool thing is, we didn't need a server side like a backend to power this. And this would actually fit really well for many store locator examples that I've seen. So let's, uh, let's take it one more step further. 
What about in the situation where we have got more data, where we do need a server-side component? And for this one, we're going to have a look at the New York City subway locator. So in New York City, there's uh, many, many subway stations. So there's a lot of data. You don't want to just throw that on a map, because that map becomes too noisy. Um, it also slows it down, so performance gets affected. So the user experience isn't particularly great. So what we want to do here is we want to make sure that our uh, application remains scalable. And we want to make sure that we, have, we can manage the data that we have. So why don't we switch to the, uh, the subway locator here. And you can see it. Again, we have a custom style. We're here near Brooklyn at the moment. So I can zoom out and give you a little bit more data about the, the, the subway stations themselves. Let me zoom back in. Now, I want you to look at something. I'm going to zoom. I want you to look at the top left of this map. As I pan the map and let go of my camera, so I'm panning and let going, it goes and populates the subway stations. That's the back end doing its job. So the way that this application works is that as the, ma the camera moves, we go and say, give me my viewport, go fetch the stations that, that are in my viewport, and populate it. So that way, we're not overloading the map with tons and tons of markers, and we're still keeping a fairly good user experience. Uh, of course, we've got info windows on these um, subway stops as well that just sort of give the name of the place as well as which line it's on. And the only other thing I want to call out is that the map itself has got the subway lines already drawn on it. That's the static data on this map. So let's switch back to the slides. And the architecture for this we're now adding a Google App Engine instance. So that stores.json file we had for Josie's example, that's now its own component. And the reason is, is that we, we need that back end. We want to make sure we're, we're scaling it out so that we're, we're providing the right amount of data. Interestingly enough, I want you to notice that like, we have a GeoJSON file here as well. So we're still going to continue to use GeoJSON in this example. It's just going to be on the server. So let me have, show you what the back end implementation looks like. The first thing we're going to do is load the GeoJSON into memory on startup into a, a data structure called an R tree. And I'm going to show you what that is in a second. Then we're going to register some API endpoints, some handlers, so that when the page needs to request for the next view, we, we have those handlers registered. And then we'll show, I'll show you the implementation of those handlers as well. So an R tree is just a really nice data structure that helps us look up location data in a nice way, in a spatial way. And so what it does is it, it has these like, minimum bounding boxes when you give it all the data. And then it generates a tree-like structure like you see in the bottom right there. So it groups these objects in nearby, uh, th that are near to one another, and then provides easy lookup methods. So that's, you can start to see how we are able to say, well, in this viewport, Archery, go and give me all the data points, and, and it's optimized for that, that type of data. In terms of our app engine uh, code, we've actually written it in Go. And the reason we're using Go, Google's Go language, is because you end up with a lot of very clean code that's easy to read um, and yet is quite capable. But App Engine supports many different languages. Um, so you could use any of them. It's just what we chose for our implementation. So for a Go, uh, Go application in App Engine, your initialization method is in it. And what we're going to do is load all of our locations into our R tree. And we're using a, a great implementation of an R tree on GitHub by D.H. Connolly. So thank you for that uh, if you're here or watching. And then what we're going to do is register those handlers. So you'll notice here we say slash data slash subway stations. And then we give a, a function name. And then we say slash data slash subway lines, and we give another function name. So basically, whenever we call that particular endpoint, that method is going to handle it for us. Let's have a look at what that's going to look like. So this is the subway stations handler. We're going to call this thing by saying slash data slash subway dash stations. And we're going to provide a viewport parameter, which says, here's my top right and bottom left coordinates. And so go fetch me the locations from that. So you see here, we're going to get the, the viewport parameter out, and we're going to create a rect, uh, rectangle. And then because of this really awesome archery implementation, we can just easily say, find me the intersection of all the locations that fit within this rectangle, return it as a GeoJSON object. 
And that's really, really cool, because then from our Go com component, we're sending it back as GeoJSON. And then, of course, on the web page, we've got that one line of implementation, map.load.geojson. Really, really neat. In terms of the web side of the implementation, those first four are exactly the same as what we had with Josie's example. We have a different style. We have a different latitude, longitude. But the code is the same. What's new is this map idle listener. So let's have a look at that. What we do with the map idle listener is we're telling the map that when the camera stops moving, when it's idle, to call this, to call this bit of code. And all we're doing is getting those bounds, the, the southwest coordinates and the northeast coordinates, and we're calling slash data slash subway stations and passing in that viewport parameter. And that's what's going to the back end. But you notice that when we call this, we're saying map.data.loadgeojson. So GeoJSON is, again, really benefiting us here. Populating the map dynamically, it's, it's handled very easily. So that's actually it. There was a bunch of boilerplate code that I didn't show. But again, we've open sourced this so you can have a look at all of the details. But that's the, that's the map-related code. There's, there's really not much there. And so we have a fairly sophisticated example where we've got interaction between back end and front end uh, to provide that awesome subway locator. Uh, with, with kind of minimal overhead on us. So we've used the JavaScript API. We put some custom styling in there. And we used uh, App Engine. We're using Go. All right. Let's mix things up even further. Let's, let's look at dynamic data. And for the dynamic data example, we're going to look at a home finder. Now, I've marked this as preview because this is something we're still working on. But I wanted to show you architecturally how it's going to fit. So I don't have a demo specifically for this one yet. Uh, but I just wanted to show you how we're building this out. And it should be fairly logical to see how we're extending it. So if you think about a real estate app, the data actually does change reasonably frequently, right? People are going to post uh, times for viewing for a particular property. Properties are going to come on the market for, for, for purchase or for, for leasing. Eventually, in general, and people may even rate it. They'll put some photos on there. In general, there's going to be a lot of change on this site. So we want to make sure we can handle all of that, that change. We want to make sure that we have a great user experience. So if we look at the architecture for this, again, it's similar to the New York subway locator. But now, instead of a GeoJSON file that we load into memory on startup, we have a database so that we can dynamically update data, read data, and populate things. Now, we're going to use Google Cloud SQL as our, as our database. It works really great with App Engine. And specifically, we're using PostgreSQL. And the reason we're using PostgreSQL is because PostgreSQL has this extension called PostGIS, which gives us spatial access methods. So the same type of intersection that we were doing with the R tree in the last example, we can do with a database. Let me show you. So our backend implementation is, again, much the same as the subway locator. We'll have different pieces of functionality. You might have a different handler for give me the viewing times uh, or give me the photos of this place and so on. But architecturally, it's more or less the same. You just might have a little bit more interaction depending on what you have in your info windows. But the new bit is the database. So Rather than show you all of the steps that are required to set up a database, I wanted to keep this focused on the maps side of things. There's a great guide here that shows you how you set up a Google Cloud instance, Google Cloud SQL instance uh, with Postgres, and then uh, how you connect it using Go to, to App Engine. It's, it's not a lot of work. It's, uh, it's, it's fairly easy to follow. So it's a great guide. But what I really wanted to call out was this SQL statement here. So when we ask the back end that, hey, here's my viewport. I want you to go find me all of the, the homes and, and apartments that are in that particular location. We can do it with a simple SQL query like this, where we just say, give me all of the locations that fit within a bounding box. And the reason we're able to do this is because of that PostGIS extension. So it's really, really worth checking out. Um, it just really simplifies our implementation. And of course, once that data comes back from the table, we're going to return it as a GeoJSON blob uh, to our front end, populate the map, and we're good to go. 
So the actual web implementation isn't going to change so much the architecturally. Yes, you're going to have different styles. Again, you're going to have uh, different markers for specific, uh, whether it's a, a place for leasing or a place for purchasing. But architecturally, it's much the same. When the viewport changes or the user clicks on a marker, we're going to bring up an info window with the right amount of information. And you'll probably have some other HTML elements around there as well. Really, really simple and really, really straightforward. So we've now covered three solutions. And we're going to get to the fourth solution now, which is uh, the real-time example. And it's, I'm a bit biased here, but it's my favorite one. It's a transport tracker. And the reason it's my favorite one is, is because it's all about Google I.O., actually. So Google I.O. is actually being held in Shoreline Amphitheater, for those of you that are watching online. It's not very convenient to get to if you're in San Francisco or if you're flying in. Um, so what we did is when we organized this conference, we provided shuttle buses that take you to and from uh, many hotels all over the area. What we thought would be really useful is to build a transport tracker to track these buses. So as attendees here uh, can attest to, if you go to the registration desk, desk or the map sandbox, you can come and see how long it's going to take for your rides to actually get to their hotels or from their hotels. So in this case, we have a constant stream of data because our buses are constantly reporting their location, and we're doing something with it. We're going to analyze that data. And I'll show you what kind of analysis we're doing. And then we're going to do, do some computation on it before we present it to the, to the user. Why don't I first show you a, a demo? All right. <clears throat> so this is our dashboard. And uh, it's not, this dashboard is not meant to be interactive because it's for attendees as they're walking to their buses and, uh, and uh, looking to leave. Well, what you can see is we have a number of uh, colored boxes, which are just the lines, the, the actual bus routes that we have. And then you can see the markers on the map. You, you see pins on the map that match the hotels. And we've colored them based on the line that, they are, that they're on. And then we have the actual bus markers as well that move around as the buses are moving. And just so you know, this is live data that we're looking at. Um, I took the risk, and it's working fine. So that's good. Um, the other thing I want you to, want to point out is these boxes that are coming. These are just HTML elements that we're drawing. But the data there is actually coming through the Maps APIs. So the times that we're giving you for estimated time to travel to each of these hotels, it's actually powered by our Directions API that give you estimates in current traffic conditions. So that's really, really cool. This is like real-time traffic information powering this app. Actually, to take it one step further, we've got a number of buses that don't leave right now, but might leave in the afternoon to go to the airport. And we use our predictive travel times to give you our, our best guess at traffic conditions at that time of the day and week. So it's not just real-time traffic. You can do some forecasting here as well. Please come check it out at the Sandbox for those of you that are here. And uh, we have documentation for those of you that are going to follow uh, from your office or from home. So let's switch back to the slides. So I'm super excited about the transport tracker. Now, the transport tracker architecturally is a little bit more complicated. It's very different to the other three examples we looked at. But basically, we have Android devices. And we wrote a little Android app that goes and reports their locations to a Firebase real-time database. And the reason we chose a Firebase real-time database is because how, of how good it is with synchronizing that data across all of the devices that are registered for it. So we report our location to, an, uh, uh, to a Firebase real-time database. But I want to share a, a secret with you, and a somewhat open secret. Our mobile devices, no matter which brand of device you have, the GPS on them can be a little bit unreliable depending on which area you're in. If you're in a tunnel, if you're in a, uh, an urban environment with lots of tall buildings, the GPS can be inaccurate. So even though you have a straight road like this, you might actually find that the GPS reports are saying you're up here, up here, down here, up here. And, and so on. It might not actually show you exactly on the map, uh, on the road itself. Now, we solve this problem with an API that we call the Roads API. And the cool thing about the Roads API is 
you just hand in your, your points, your, your latitude, longitudes, and it returns you back a different set of points that have been snapped to a road for you. And we can do this because we know that these are vehicles. What's even cooler is if you're on like a, a roundabout or like a curved road and your location data is being sampled, I don't know, once every 15 or 30 or 60 seconds, your actual, and you've tried to plot that, you're going to have these jagged lines when you've got curved roads. The roads API will actually return you additional points in that array so that you get a smooth, uh, gradual curve uh, as you're following that road. So it's really, really neat. And so when I said we needed to analyze that data earlier, we have a compute engine instance that we've written in Node.js. And what we do is we read from the Firebase real-time database. We then take those locations, snap them to a road, and then we send them to the directions API to go ahead and give us time estimates. And then on our web page itself, we just present that data. So we're just literally reading from that same Firebase real-time database, showing the position of the buses. We have some HTML that goes and shows uh, the, the bus routes and so on. Really, really fun. So on the back end side of things, what we're going to be doing is uh, looking at the Firebase real-time database, reading those locations, snapping them to a road, and then predicting the travel times. Let me show you what that looks like. The first thing I want to call out is we're using Node.js. And if you're using Node.js, we have a fantastic client library that wraps our APIs, that makes it really easy to use the Google Maps APIs in Node. It's so easy that once we've initialized the client, and you can find out how you set it up uh, at that link, to use the Roads API, it's one line of code. Literally, we, we call snap to Roads, pass in a bunch of points, we get a re return set of points. That's how easy this library makes it. Just a single line of code. So do check out the library itself. In terms of the directions, we do a little bit more work there. So think about the route itself. We have, uh, you might be starting at Shoreline Amphitheater, looking, going to five hotels, and then going to the last destination. So you've got an origin, you've got a destination, and you've got all these stops that you need to make in the middle. So the way we do it for the directions request is that we take that first point, we call that the origin. The last point, we call that the destination. And everything in between, we just call that a waypoint. And the directions API can handle these waypoints. So when it gives you those time estimates, it's actually calculating going from point A to point B, point B to point C, and so on. In fact, the response that it gives you, which we're going to look at now, breaks it up that way as well. So again, because of our uh, client library that we're using, the directions request itself is just a single line of code once you've created your request. And we're saying, give us the response back in JSON. So w once we just go do some error checking, make sure that the response was valid, the first thing that we do is look at the legs of our trip. So our leg would be going from shoreline to hotel A. And then the second leg would be hotel A to hotel B. But for each leg, you have a number of points that you have to take as well, some paths. So for each leg, we can actually get the duration that it takes. And we can even draw a line if we want, a polyline. We can see how long it takes per point as well. So let's look at a, a specific leg now from Hotel A to Hotel B. We can iterate through that here as well just by looking at each point and then getting the, the, the time that we need to so we can display that on our, on our page or write it back to our Firebase database. So there's a bit of code here, but it's, if you break it apart, it's fairly simple to follow. We have our whole route. We go to find each leg. And within each leg, you'll have a getting from hotel A to B would be turn right here, go straight there, turn left there. And those are our points for each of our legs. So we use a number of APIs. This solution is like entirely end to end. We've got uh, the Fuse Location Provider providing the, uh, up, uh, powering the Android app. So that's what we're using to get locations as accurately as possible, as possible, as I said. We're using Firebase real-time database to like, keep that data in real time. So as soon as we have a new piece of data, we read it from Node.js. And then the Maps API is providing us tons of capabilities. We're not just visualizing it on a map this time. We're using the Directions API to get real-time or predictive travel time uh, information. And we're using the Roads API to snap it to a road. In fact, we use the Places API to provide the information about Shoreline or the hotels as well. 
So that was our four solutions that I wanted to talk to you about today. I hope you can see now that by us providing a reference lounge room for you, a reference implementation, that you can see how you can take this kind of solution and use it for whatever use case you have. What I also want to say is this is something new that we're trying. So we think it's really useful, but we need, to, we need to hear from you. We'd love for you to go check out our documentation, check out our source code, give us feedback. We're always listening. And tell us what more you'd like, what use cases you'd like us to, to look at, what other solutions should we build for you. Because we think that this is quite useful, but we, need to, we would love to validate it. All of these solutions that I presented here, the Home Finder is not yet ready, but the other three solutions, you can go check them out at developers.google.com slash maps slash solutions. And of course, you can check out information about all of our APIs at developers.google.com slash maps. Now, this is the last session on the Google Maps APIs at Google I.O. this year. If you haven't been able to attend any of the others or you're watching online, I've put the titles up here so that you can go look them up on YouTube uh, at a later stage. We're also going to have office hours at 1.30 uh, in the office hours section today. So if you've got any questions, if you want us to have a look at your specific use cases or you want some more information on the solutions, please come and talk to us. With that, I really want to say thank you. We're, I'm always humbled by the fact that you give up so much of your time to be here. Uh, we hope that what we're sharing with you is useful um, and worth your time. I'm happy to take a handful of questions now. So if you want to come and come to the microphone, uh, you can ask your questions.